Good morning. This is Tyler Crone, chair of the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted to be here in conversation this morning with Alan Lebovitz. I hope I've gotten your name correct. Please correct us as you get underway. Who is running for commissioner of public lands? We are so delighted to be interviewing with you and over to you to share a little bit more about yourself, Alan. Thank you so much. Uh, that was perfect. Thank you for the for the introduction. So um, the reason I'm here today is because we're facing some big challenges in Washington state. We're experiencing a wildfire crisis with our state blanketed in smoke most of the summer and whole communities being destroyed. Um, I was on the response actually this summer to the fires outside of Spokane, uh, working uh, as a public information officer on the incident management team there. And I saw things that I've never seen before in Washington. Um, and uh, it's it's a, a crisis that I think we need to get uh, to immediately. So we're also losing forests and sage lands and critical fish and wildlife habitat at a critical rate, uh, as well as communities. And then of course, our salmon and our orca are disappearing. We can change this though. And we still have time to get ahead of the wildfire crisis. We can still protect and restore our forests and sage lands, and we can still recover salmon populations. But we need bold leadership that will take action now and leadership that actually understands what it will take to accomplish this. And this is why I wanna serve as commissioner of public lands. Uh, I understand these issues and I have a vision for leading this change. So I have over 30 years of hands-on experience uh, as an ecologist, uh, as a forest land manager, a wildland firefighter, and a leader. I've been with the DNR now for over a decade, and I currently serve the Commissioner of Public Lands as her Wildland Fire and Forest Resiliency Liaison. I also chair the Wildland Fire Advisory Committee. So like I said, I've worked as an ecologist for over 30 years in Washington State, um, and implemented estuary, river, forest, and shrub step restoration across the state during that time. I've worked as a forester and managed working timberlands for both the Nature Conservancy as well as industrial timberland owners. I've also served as a wildland firefighter for over a decade now, both in uh, fireline operations and also on command staff. So these are the uh, skills that I would bring, the qualifications and experience that I'd bring to address these big challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Our first question this morning will be asked by Laura Marie. Uh, hello. Uh, the DNR has an important role generating non-tax revenue for the state. How will you balance the need to generate trust revenue with other values that state lands provide, such as carbon storage and habitat? So, so that's one of my key priorities, uh, would be one of my key priorities as Commissioner of Public Lands, one of the big reasons I'm running. Um, I think it starts with, in particular, setting goals based on generating value, not volume of natural resources produced from state lands. And that's a big shift. It's much bigger maybe than it sounds. Um, you know, in part, uh, I think we need to figure out how to add more value to the resources that we do extract. Um, we also need to understand uh, the other, all the values that, that forest lands, sage lands, and other public lands provide. In addition to generating the tax value, um, there's an important part of generating a double bottom line, which is how do we use these public lands to spur economies, particularly local rural economies, with how we manage them. And there's some key ways we can do that, both in how we manufacture what comes off of these lands, but then also how we do the work that's needed in them to restore them, to make them more resilient to wildfire um, and, and other um, natural resource management actions. Thank you so much. The next question this morning will be asked by Alex W. Yeah, in recent years, DNR has sought to take new actions to support healthy forests and reduce wildfire risk. What are your thoughts on steps taken so far? And are there changes or additions to this approach that you would bring? Um, kind of a second part to this question, what are your perspectives on the DNR correctional camps program, uh, having incarcerated individuals working in wildfire suppression? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That also gets at another one of my priorities. 
So uh, having worked at DNR and particularly in the wildfire program for a while now, um, I've seen some transformative change in, in how we've been responding to wildfire. Uh, our ability to um, respond and suppress fires before they become big is better than it ever has been before. But we really need to focus now on, on getting ahead of the problem and focusing on the root cause, which is uh, restoring healthy forests and healthy sagelands we often forget about that 10 million acres in Eastern Washington when we talk about restoration. And what we need is, is restoration of um, the natural resilience of these lands to fire. It takes more than just thinning forests or grazing cheatgrass, it takes ecological restoration. And I think that's something that we have not been doing so far. Um, there's also, uh, you, you, met, you asked about the use of correctional camps in, in this work. I, I think my experience has been that, um, particularly with our post-release fire crew, uh, it provides some pretty exceptional opportunities to individuals to build skills, um, both in uh, responding to fire, but also in doing restoration work. And so I, I think there are some really great opportunities to employ them um, as, as uh, useful members of the DNR team. And so that would be something that that I would I would focus on. The last piece I'd add is that uh, we really need to double down when it comes to restoration on um, forest lands and sage lands with reestablishing natural fire regimes. So reintroducing fire, prescribed fire is absolutely vital. And that would be a priority of mine. Thank you so much. The next question will be asked by Stephanie. All right. Yeah, well, um, so as you know, DNR has a large staff that's uh, distributed across programs and regions, including seasonal employees. How would you help to build strong and effective relationships for staff and teams all across the state? And what steps would you take to improve equity and environmental justice outcomes for Washington State? So, so that's an issue I've given quite a bit of thought to, as you, as you might imagine, being at DNR for over a decade. Um, we have a very, very talented staff across the state at all, at all different levels. Um, I think one thing that, that we really need to work on is our communication between leadership um, and implementers, uh, the people that do the work. Uh, and a big part of that is around explaining the intent and explaining the why that they're doing the work. Um, it, it's also important to give them opportunities to uh, contribute to the discussion as we develop plans for implementation. Um, and, and I think there are a number of ways that we can do that, um, that, that really simply focus on improving communications. Uh, it sounds like a, a, a very one dimensional issue, maybe in some ways the way I describe it, but that's really what it boils down to. Um, I also think we have a lot of room to improve, um, I guess the diversity of the, um, composition of our staff and, um, you know, in particular, reaching out to communities um, that aren't represented in our staff, and there are many of those. So the first is in identifying those communities uh, and then improving the way that we recruit from them and the way that we evaluate their qualifications. Uh, one example that we're working on right now that I'm helping to lead that's uh, specifically aimed at that is about building uh, capacity within um, some tribal uh, communities to participate in wildfire. They've expressed an interest in building that skill. It's a skill that they don't have in this particular tribe, um, and they don't have the resources in order to do the training. What's unique about wildland firefighting is you can't go to class and then show up on the job and be able to do it safely. Um, it takes a lot of experience and training, and that's, that's a big hurdle. So the solution that we've proposed is really one of mentorship, uh, where we team up um, new um, people from these communities with experienced firefighters that work on what we call co-op engines. So there are engines that are shared between the two organizations that serve dual purposes. I think that's a model that we need to replicate throughout DNR, throughout our programs. The last prepared question this morning will be asked by Shep. What do you anticipate will be the biggest challenge you would face as land commissioners, land commissioner if elected? 
Well, probably the most honest answer, answer to that is I don't know, because I'm sure there will be uh, challenges coming at me that I cannot anticipate. So it's uh, the what we don't know. Um, the one that I do know about, though, I think is uh, being able to hear all sides of the issues when there are many strong and diverse opinions, uh, which there definitely are when it comes to natural resource management and, and wildfire. Um, being able to reach out to constituents, particularly those that um, do not or maybe cannot um, share their perspectives or are frequently overlooked uh, is a challenge. And it takes very deliberate actions and it takes time. It takes a lot of time and that's often in short supply. I think that's a place where I see leadership um, failing frequently, um, no matter what organization you're in, is taking the time to do that, that uh, outreach to the people that you don't hear from um, that you should be hearing from. And so I think that's critical because it's important to consider all sides of issues um, when making big decisions like the ones that we'll have to make about managing public lands. Um, and that's a key part of my leadership philosophy. One example of that is in once again, working with our tribal um, sovereign nations. Uh, what I've learned over uh, a decade plus is that it's important to take extra time and to meet them on their ground to actually go and talk with them to seek out their input. Um, simply following the traditional approaches of sending emails and making phone calls and setting up meetings like Zoom meetings like this just doesn't do it. It takes time to actually have honest communications and dialogues. Um, and, and that's got to be a very deliberate focus and something we really need to commit to and would be a priority of mine. Thank you so much, Alan. What we'll do now is we will have our eboard members raise their hand and ask any follow-up. Um, and if we don't have too many follow-ups, we'll also provide you the chance to share anything with us. So let's see if there are any hands with further questions. I see Alex's hand and we'll try to keep these answers a little bit shorter to about like one minute. So Alex, over to you. Thank you. And I posted the question in the chat in case you need to take a look at it. Uh, but earlier you had mentioned DNR's work with salmon and uh, orcas. And I wanted to know what do you see the role of DNR uh, in rewilding efforts for terrestrial keystone species, um, and as well as other species who have had a historic range in the PNW, but don't necessarily have that anymore due to um, mostly our faults, like as humans and development. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate that question. Um, so that gets at um, uh, the the priority that I have regarding, actually regarding uh, restoration of forests for uh, wildfire resiliency. When I say restoration for wildfire resiliency, I mean restoration of um, ecological processes and functions in these forests that, that go far beyond um, simply making them better prepared for fire. So that extends to improving habitat, um, that's that's how these um, that's how these systems historically worked, and and that would have to be a priority for how we manage not only our conservation lands but also our working lands. Um, and from the experience that I've had in the past managing timberlands, I I know that's possible. And so that also starts with setting goals, uh, like I mentioned um, uh, in the the conversation about providing values from forest land. Uh, I think one of the values that we need to consider providing is that habitat benefit. Uh, it's quantifiable, um, and I think returns can return uh, an actual economic benefit, um, but it, it starts with setting those goals. Um, and those goals um, uh, are, are not well established at this point. We have rules that guide us, but I think we can do better in, in establishing um, more ambitious goals for providing terrestrial habitat. Thank you. Don? Hi, Alan. I also put mine in the chat um, as an anthropologist who worked with the cultural resources at JBLM and as an ecologist yourself, you and I both are aware of how vital it is to protect beaver habitats, um, which is correlated to salmon habitats. How will you as public lands commissioner protect one of the last endangered native beaver habitats, salmon hatcheries, such as Longfellow Creek from development and light rail construction? 
so that's a multi-layered question. Uh, I got stuck on Beaver right when you said that, because mm -hmm. that's actually been uh, a focus of my work. In fact, one of the first papers I ever published was on uh, how to restore beaver habitat uh, or how to restore habitat to improve beaver usage uh, to provide ecological benefits. And so uh, I've also helped um, the state develop a assessment tool for finding locations for prioritizing for restoring beaver habitat. And it's now part of the DNR's uh, GIS system. Um, so that would obviously be a um, an initiative that I would continue to emphasize. Um, I, you know, when it comes to uh, making sure that that we conserve lands that are important for for beaver habitat, um, <clears throat> I I'd say once again that's that's simply a matter of setting goals uh, where we identify where those priorities are. For example, using the um, the assessment tool that I helped develop to figure out where those priority habitats are, uh, and then structuring our management of those lands um, to meet meet those goals. Thank you so much, Alan. Jeremy? Hi, I also put my question in the chat. Um, you had mentioned a lot earlier about ecosystem restoration, but as we saw with the Bolt Creek fire two years ago, we're now starting to see large wildfires and wetter forests in Western Washington driven by human-driven climate change. Now, I realize this was nas on national forest land, mostly not DNR land, but what does ecosystem restoration mean in areas like this that just haven't historically seen as many fires? So, so that's a that might be one of the hardest questions for an ecologist, um, and and it really involves um, a lot of modeling, <laughs> which which makes us nervous because all models are wrong, and and so it it requires us to. Um, uh, anticipate how our forests and how our, our sage lands are changing um, and to um, uh, consider that as we develop our restoration strategies. And I think it it, it in part involves uh, building a substantial amount of uh, diversity in um, habitat types and in ecosystem types and uh, in particular focusing on reestablishing processes. That's something that we miss all the time in ecological restoration. We focus on building the structure, um, the, the features that we see, and we neglect building uh, or reestablishing the processes that, that produce habitat, that produce the, uh, the functions that, that we believe are important in these ecosystems. And so I think when it comes to uh, adapting to climate change with um, uh, e ecological restoration, it is doubling down on re re restoring ecological processes. Thank you, Alan. I'll pause here to see if there's one last follow-up from our board. And if I don't see a hand, I give the flow. Oh, I see Jeremy's hand. Here you go, Jeremy. Yeah. Um. One, one other question I wanted to ask, and it's um, less about science, but more just about um, the, the election itself. Um, I yeah. mean, I Obviously, uh, you joined the race, um, it looks like, in the last month or two, um, and most of the other candidates had been running for several months, so I assume there was something that you saw that was missing from the current candidate field. What What is that? that uh... um, so I think there are many fine candidates that are running. Um, I know essentially all of them. Um I think what I see and what really encouraged me or drove me to run is a, a feeling of responsibility um, to um, provide leadership based upon the experience that I have. Um, what what uh, I see in myself that I don't see in the other candidates, like I mentioned earlier, is 30 years of hands-on experience uh, with all the issues that we just talked about. Um, I, I also bring, uh, I think, a unique perspective on leadership uh, having served as the wildland fire liaison and, and a chair of a multi uh, organ uh, multi member stakeholder group, I understand what it takes to build uh, cooperation and partnership, and and that's something that's absolutely vital uh, for achieving these big goals that were um, that we need to achieve uh, regarding natural resource management and how the DNR functions. So, those are. Um, skills that that I feel I bring to the table more than any other candidate at this point. Thank you so much, Alan, for joining with us. That ends the formal part of our interview with you and our recording. We'll